Welcome to the Movement PT Coffee Cast, where we sit down and talk about physical therapy, health, and whatever else comes to mind during our coffee infused conversations. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Movement PT Coffee Cast. My name's Dalton, and with me, as always, is my beautifully bearded friend, William. William, how are we doing today? Good, man. Beard's growing every day as we speak. How about you? Is it? Mine is not, because I can't grow a beard, but um, are you trying to grow your beard out once again? Because it's been quite tame lately. Yeah, I think I'm going for a long beard. That's like my next phase of beard growing is going to be a long one. So nice. some some to look forward to, eh? Winter <laughs> winter is coming, as they say. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, okay, enough of this banter. Let's get on. Let's get on already. Um, okay, <laughs> we're gonna get into the episode, guys. Today we are talking to Melanie Hudson. She's a DPT student at Radford University. Um, she's also Oreos and squats on Instagram. You can catch her there squatting, deadlifting, bench pressing, lots of weight, and also posting amazing pictures of desserts, like unbelievable looking desserts. Um, Mel, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm good. I'm good. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Yeah. I want to get to the Instagram page right away. Like the one thing I I love about your feed is like, it's just you like crushing weights and like this food looks amazing. Is that just kind of your life? Yeah, basically that's like my two, my two um, hobbies is eating and lifting. (laughs) Yeah. I started this page like a couple of years ago because I thought it would be super annoying if I was always posting like lifting footage and food on my normal Instagram. So I made like a private, like anonymous page that didn't even have my name on it and just started posting like food and lifting videos. <laughs> so that's like <laughs> kind of where that started. I was kind of wondering how many Oreos do you consume a week? Um, well, nowadays, not as many because if I buy a pack, it's going to be gone in a day. So, but definitely it was a pretty consistent habit when I was growing up. So when I was thinking about like what I wanted to name my page, I was like, okay, what's my favorite food that I eat like all the time? And I was like, okay, it's going to be Oreos. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. And I'm kind of like biased towards Fudgios to be honest, but I can dig it. (laughs) I wonder if that's a Canadian thing. Do you you guys have Fudgios in, in America? uh i don't know i think that's a i like didn't grow up here so i don't know oh yeah yeah. all right let's get into you tell us a little bit about (laughs) a little bit more about you in terms of who you are what you're doing now um with school and whatnot so i'm currently finishing up my second clinical rotation it's in inpatient rehab so i'm in a hospital setting i have one week left and then i start my last year of pt school And so that'll just be, we have two weeks off, have one more semester and one more final clinical. And then we graduate in May. So it's coming up pretty quick. Oh yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I was just going to say, you know, like how did you decide to get into physio? Um, So I kind of always wanted to work in healthcare. Uh, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do but from like a really young age I just had like a really positive experience um being in the hospital with like and working with like awesome nurses awesome doctors and I knew that I wanted to help people in the future how I was helped when I was a kid and so I at first I thought I wanted to be a nurse and then I kind of just started taking psychology classes in high school and was like, okay, I want to be a psychologist who works with kids with cancer. Like it was super specific. And I kind of just always had that as like my end game. Like that's what I wanted to do. And then junior year of college, I kind of, I was in a sorority and we, our philanthropy was a children's hospital and we went and visited and it just kind of hit me how, difficult it was going to be to work in that setting full time uh, for me personally. And so I was kind of like, okay, um, 
So this is my passion. I definitely want to help these kids maybe through like volunteering, but I don't know if I want to make it my profession. So I've always been really like an advocate for health and fitness and trying to get people more active. Like that's always just been a passion of mine. And so I was like, I mean, I like physical therapy. And so (laughs) I think I'm going to go into that. Like it was kind of like a not really a spur of the moment decision, but because it's always kind of been a backup plan, I guess, um, after psychology, like that was also another interest of mine. But yeah, I, I, junior year of college, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to, you know, take a gap year and get my stuff together. Cause I had to take, you know, the GRE and all that stuff. So yeah, kind of changed my mind last minute there. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I feel like that's a big thing with physio is a lot of times when we've asked people that question, it's one of these things where it's, it's sort of something you come to after a lot of experience, you know, like I don't, I don't think many people decide when they're in like high school to become a physio. It's one of those things where you kind of like combine your interests and you're like, well, I know I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to, you know, be in school forever. Um, yeah. I know I like being active and that sort of thing. And then so you end up going into physio. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mel, I wanted to dive into a little bit, like I know your story, like growing up, like being diagnosed with leukemia at like the age of eight. And I'm, I'm assuming that's like what you were kind of referring to in terms of like spending lots of time um, in the hospital as a kid and then wanting to go and be a, like a psychologist for, for kids with cancer and whatnot. I just wanted to like ask you how that like situation obviously shaped you as a person and maybe influenced you um, in, in more ways than just becoming like a physiotherapist. I think um, one really big thing for me is that it gives me perspective and it kind of like on days where I'm having a hard day or I don't really feel like doing this day, you know, or I get down up about things. I remember that there was a time where I wasn't really able to just go live my day as I pleased and that there's a lot of people that are going through very difficult situations and families that are going through really difficult situations. And it kind of just brings me back to like appreciating what I have, which sounds, you know, so cheesy, but it's, it's like once you've experienced a period of your life where you have a lot of freedoms taken away from you, then you appreciate them when you do have them, you know, like being so sick that you can't go to school, um, which we kind of take for granted, you know, or we complain about. Um, so it kind of helps me just become more grounded and remind myself, um, and like gain some perspective. And then also, obviously it's really influenced me because the nurses and doctors that I had as a kid, like they were incredible and talking about, you know, treating the human, they were so about that. Like they made you feel like family and I wanted to be able to provide that type of experience for patients that I would have in the future. Yeah, no, for sure. That's huge. That perspective thing um, is huge. And it it just goes to show you how how much of an influence like healthcare professionals can have on any individual that they interact with. Um, And it's important to make sure we are treating the human like in front of us and taking those things into consideration because, you know, that interaction, if it goes the other way and it's negative, could definitely alter someone's understanding or thoughts around the, that profession, whether it be like physiotherapy or nurses or like medicine in general. So I think it's very important that we, we portray that in our interactions. So, um, yeah, just to cut, Will, do you have something? Yeah, I was going to say like, I'm, I'm curious if like just having that experience um, led you to going into the degree that you decide to go into. Yeah, for psychology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah. I wanted to be, uh, there was this one psychologist that I didn't even know she was a psychologist when I was a kid. Like she would come in and see me in the hospital and kind of just make sure I was like caught up on schoolwork and probably was doing like assessments like low key, but I had no idea. Um, but she would like check in on me and my family and stuff. And I wanted to be able to be like that rock for these families that are going through that um, and kind of work with kids. But I think it was a combination of things when I decided to change career paths, like 
not only was it going to be difficult emotionally, but I also just had such a passion for fitness that I really wanted to be in a career that would allow me to work with it in some form. Uh, so I think it was kind of like a little bit of both of those things. When you, um, obviously going into like PT school, did you realize, um, at that time how much of an influence like psychology was going to have on like the profession or, or was it just something that like now you're like, Oh wow, this is crazy. I can now take like what I really loved in psychology and pretty much bring it to the, the physiotherapy world or the fitness world. Yeah, I, I actually thought I was at a disadvantage. Like I remember, I think it was the first day of classes, like our professor uh, jokingly was like, oh, do we have any psychology majors in here? And there was like two of us, we raised our hand and they were kind of like laughing about it. And I was like, I thought, I was like, dang it, everyone else was like pre-PT or like they did like kinesiology or um, human nutrition, food and exercise is like a really big degree at Virginia Tech where I went to school. And everyone was like an HNFE major or the ones I listed before. And then there was just me, like the psychology major. And I was like, it made me feel like I had so much catching up to do because I had no like exercise science or kinesiology background. I really didn't know much about that. So I was like, great, like I'm off to such a like disadvantage here. But now it's, it's definitely, I'm starting to see it a lot differently. And I don't think it's like the theories and all the different schools of thought that we learned that are helpful. It's just like being exposed to that repeatedly through all the coursework I had, it just teaches you about how different we are. And it's like, it's helpful to draw from that when we talk about like meeting patients where they are or trying to be empathetic when someone has like a completely different viewpoint than you or when it's like difficult to understand why they're acting a certain way. It's, I feel like it's just given me a little bit more understanding um, and I'm able to be a little more like patient and less judgmental, I think. I think it's like kind of like broadening the lens of how you kind of view somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think like, it just makes it easier for me. Like when I first heard about like the biopsychosocial model or like, you know, pain is more than just tissue damage. Like those concepts just like complete, like immediately, like I changed my paradigm so fast because it just resonated with me. Like it made sense. I was like, Oh, okay. Like I get this, like this makes a lot of sense to me. So I didn't have a hard time going from like a purely biomedical model to that. Like it actually, I feel like that background just made it easier for me to like update my beliefs. Do you think there's a bit of a bias um, within your education and stuff uh, towards more of the biological aspects of uh, how we, you know, see people in pain or, or do you think there is enough of kind of like psychological aspects and social aspects to like, uh, you know, our education? I think, I mean, there's a very big, like the focus is on the biological and like, you know, special tests and like differential diagnosis and all of that. That's the main focus. I think most programs are trying to incorporate more of the like psychosocial aspects, but then you like run into the problem of it becoming a dichotomy where that's like its own class And it's like, okay, you should ask people about their socioeconomic status or like how they feel about their pain. But it's like, they kind of, it just isn't a priority. You know, it's kind of like, well, these are just like the soft skills that like you can kind of like ask them if you have time or like stuff like that. And I don't feel like it's as appreciated as it should be. And it's not woven into, I just feel like you could just combine it and just show that you're treating the person like all these things are combining into your treatment without kind of like weeding it out. If that makes sense. Yeah. hundred percent. Me and Will experienced the exact same thing in physio school and talked many times about how it needs to be more interwoven so people can have a better understanding of how it layers together rather than having it as like a separate like dichotomy. And a lot of times the psychosocial side of things or the communication side of things were not like they were separate and they were also not as like um, intricate as like the other aspects of like the bio side of things. And it just makes it very hard to conceptualize like how they interact together. And you don't really get good practice in physio school of 
inter- having those things combined together and implemented into like a plan of care. Yeah. And I think the issue is just how generally people view those things because our, like our program tries, like we, in our uh, psychosocial class, our professor would try to have us like have these conversations with each other and like role play, but everyone's like, well, this is dumb. Like anyone can do this. Like anyone knows how to be like a good person. But the thing is like you get into clinical and you realize you don't like, I just had so many experiences where I'm talking to a patient and I'm like, this is so hard. Like, I don't know how to connect with you because maybe it's something I've never, you know, I've never ran into someone who thinks the way they do, or there's a lot of like different things going on. And I'm like, I don't know how to handle this, you know? So I think that is huge. And I think, I wish I had like more practice with that. I think it's like this thing too, like you're talking about, we tend to like dichotomize everything. It's like, we're still viewing things as like a pendulum. You know, and there's this common thing where it's like, oh, like, don't let the pendulum swing too far. But with a human being, there is no pendulum. Yeah. Like, things like their beliefs and and stuff are going to emerge as, like, you're trying to go through an exercise, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that's why, like, the biopsychosocial model and stuff, like, they all have their limitations. And I think just thinking of pain as, like, an experience and just viewing all these things as contributors and not trying to, like, like, you know, sort it all out or, like, blame one thing or, like, I don't know. It's There's just so much that plays into it, you know? Yeah. Um, so in terms of, obviously, your background – in psychology has helped you, but is there any other like resources or things that you've used so far, like over your, your, um, PT school, like experience to help you learn more about this stuff, like communication and, you know, a biopsychosocial model, et cetera. Yeah. So I think the first resource that I stumbled on was about pain science and it was Greg Lehman's, uh, recoveries ebook. And that was the first time that I ever started to kind of question how I had been viewing things. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. So like I read through that and it kind of helped me at that time with my own, like I was going through kind of like recovering or trying to recover from an injury. And it helped me kind of understand why I was still hurting because I, I didn't understand. Like I was like, I should be healed by now. Like, why can't I train the way I want to? Um, and so that kind of just, it was like the perfect timing because I was experiencing it. And I think it's really valuable to like experience it because then you can apply it better, you know? So anyway, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, but (laughs) I found, I found that ebook and that really helped me through that. And kind of, I started questioning things that I was learning. And then I found a clinical athlete podcast and barbell medicine. And I just started following like, all these people on Instagram and seeing kind of like getting into this like echo chamber a little bit of like people who I was like, Oh, like I agree with all of this. This is awesome. Um, (laughs) So, uh, so I did all that. And then um, I found Zach Gabor and the level up initiative and they kind of like brought me back a little bit because I feel like I had gone really far into like getting really frustrated because I felt like everything I was learning in school was the complete opposite of what I was reading. So I was like, this is not best evidence. Like I'm reading all this stuff. Like if people would just like be up to date, like this is so frustrating. Why do we have to learn this? And I was like very antagonistic. Like I was literally the definition of that antagonistic student. And like, you could just feel like my classmates like sigh when I would raise my hand in class. Like they're like, Oh no. <laughs> they know it's coming. <laughs> um, but anyway, and I mean, I feel like that's gotten a little bit better over this, over the couple, past couple years. Um, because especially going through the level up mentorship, because it just made me realize that there's, there's a lot of reasons why we're taught what we're taught in school. And like, it sucks because there are governing bodies who like force us to like learn about ultrasound and stuff, which in my opinion by now it's like, okay, we, we can kind of move past that, but like we still have to learn about modalities and stuff like that. Um, but it it just, it may, it helped me have better conversations and approach people in better ways. So like professors, for example, I would send them an email or like, send them a podcast or talk to and let them kind of like listen to it on their own time. And then maybe they'd want to discuss it with me or having a discussion in private instead of like 
trying to make them look wrong in front of the whole class, which wasn't like, that wasn't my intent, but that's probably how it came off, you know? Cause it's just like, well, I know this. And it's like, really, I didn't know anything because I was a first or second year PT student, you know, like I don't really know that much. Um, so I guess it kind of like humbled me and made me think about where people are coming from and why they have the beliefs that they do. Like, how much time they've invested in building these beliefs and like medicine and healthcare is always changing and you can't blame people for having outdated beliefs. If that's what they were taught, it's like the longer you practice a certain way, the harder it is to come out of that, you know, and the more positive experiences you have with that, the amount of patients you help like with manual therapy or whatever it is that you think is the most important intervention that I might disagree with. Like, it's still like, it's not that you're like a bad person trying to like, you know, I don't know, make your patients dependent on you. It's just that that's what you were taught and that's how you help people. You know, like I think a lot of people are just trying to help and they've had positive experience from it in the past. And so then they continue to teach it in school. And it's like, you don't really stop to think, okay, like, what is the actual mechanism or like what is the literature showing because you already know it's working because you see it work you know so it's Mm -hmm. like I don't know I think it just listening to like Zach and Steph and Mike talk about effective communication and like the all the cognitive biases that we have and like Jared Hall too he's another great um he puts out a lot of great content on Instagram that kind of just it's helpful to help explain things to people. So I think just reading their content and becoming less antagonistic was super helpful. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you covered a lot, like really good stuff in that little answer there. Um, just a couple of things, like one, that resource, like Greg Lehman, like if there's any students listening or whatnot, like check, definitely check that out. Like Greg, Greg Lehman was someone who changed my, mine and Will's perspective as well. That was kind of our starting point. Um, obviously, Level Up Initiative, we've been through the mentorship. We're hopefully going to be mentors at some point, um, and we totally 100% believe in that. Um, I think a big thing you said, and, and I would agree with this from myself personally, and, and I'm sure Will could attest to, was that idea of um, – almost respectful challenging, I think is what Zach kind of labeled it. And it it did definitely, we were in the same situation as you at times where we were, you know, we got to this point where we were angry because we were learning all these new, these things in school. And then we're the stuff that we were learning outside was completely different. And you're like, you kind of get upset that like your education is almost letting you down in ways at times. Um, And I think we took that same antagonistic, antagonistic approach, like, as you did. Um, and then we started to realize like, there's no sense in doing that. And, you know, some people again are coming from different perspectives, different backgrounds, have different experiences. And I think we started to kind of transition away from being angry and just more focusing on like, how can we get better? How can we develop ourselves and how can we push that information out to people that want to listen, that want to learn and change their understanding around things? Yeah, I think, the other cool thing, like, it's just recognizing that you don't have to change everybody's mind right away uh, <clears throat> or, you know, fix everybody's kind of approach one, like, all at once. Because if you even just expose one or two people to something like Greg Lehman's content, uh, that could open up an avenue uh, for that person to uh, learn a different way and then in turn kind of influence all the people that they end up seeing in the future, which is not something small, you know? So like you don't have to go so aggressively. You just have to kind of put it out there so that somebody might be interested in kind of like learning those new perspectives. You end up having a bigger impact than maybe you, would have in the other way. Yeah. I don't know if that made any sense. No, no, it does. I think, I think it's a balance, right? I think it's a balance because I think we need to be trying to push, right. You need to push a little bit because there's a big like loss in in our education with this, with this stuff. Like we're missing, we're missing out. Mm -hmm. It's getting better, but it's being missed. And it, it makes a huge difference. Like 
I'm, I'm, we're what a year out now. Well, almost mm-hmm. of being physios. Like if I didn't learn the stuff that I learned, like my last year physio outside of my mm-hmm. education through these things and, and now going through like a, for my first year, it's like, it would have been totally different. Like I'm so mm-hmm. thankful that I found that information and that's why I want to push it on like other students and people to start to at least consider these things. Cause it changes your perspective. Like we talked about earlier around like, humans and interaction and it also just makes more sense like when you get into an uh, eval and this person is like breaking down or they're like they're they're talking about all these beliefs and and you don't really know like what to do and you're trying different things that like worked in school and it's not working and you're like why isn't this working what do I do like it started to help me be more like okay with the fact that like I don't really know exactly what's going on but like here's some other strategies that we can use and that's why I think we need to push a bit as well we probably need some people like Adam Meekins you <laughs> yeah. know, who are being really aggressive about it and like thrusting it out there because uh, it may not you know at first like I know when, when we first saw that we were like whoa you know and you're kind of mm-hmm. like taken aback but eventually maybe that'll kind of reach out to certain people but you know everyone can't take that approach but i think you know uh having a balance is probably needed yeah no for sure it is definitely so mel you kind of touched on it a little bit with regards to like having your own injury um and how you dealt with it and why you think like it's important for it was important for yourself to go through something like that to have a better understanding. So maybe we can talk a little bit about like what that injury was and how you went about like helping yourself get back from that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I was in my junior year, I think of college and I had just gotten more serious about lifting. I wanted to start lifting heavy, get strong. Um, I had just learned how to deadlift and I was lifting with a friend And, um, I was kind of just doing my own thing. Like I didn't follow any type of programming and he was like, Hey, I'm going to start this program where I squat five days a week. Like, do you want to join me? And I was like, sure. Um, so I went from literally lifting once a week to, or not lifting once a week, doing like squats and deads once a week to five days a week. And, um, I had never worked with like high intensities either. Cause I was always like in the eight to 10 range. So it was like this massive spike in workload. Um, and so I started having some back pain and my friend was like, Oh, don't worry about it. Like it'll be fine. And so I kind of just kept squatting and it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And then I started having, you know, like pain down my legs and like numbness and all of that. And I was like, this is probably not good. So I was like, I like Googled it. And it was like, oh, well, it's probably a muscle strain. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just not squat or deadlift for like a couple, like a month or so and see what happens. And so I would just keep going back into the gym and trying to like just see if it was like better um, every couple of weeks or so. And it never was. And so after a couple of months, I was like, well, maybe I should go to like a PT because uh, obviously there's something wrong and I'm tired of being in pain because it was affecting my daily life. Like I couldn't sit for more than like, 20 minutes or stand for too long. And it was just like very painful. So I went to a, um, PT who they were McKenzie certified. So basically I just looked up like the highest rating of PT, like in my area. And I went there for back pain and he was awesome. I actually ended up doing my first clinical there, but they were very, very rooted in the biomedical model. And when I was my got my injury explained to me it was that my disc was like a jelly donut and that when I flex like because I you know we all slouch and blah 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 our like the jelly gets pushed towards the back and then like if you do like if I squat with like a butt wink or deadlift with a rounded back then like that can make it like shoot out the back and I was like okay I know (laughs) and so I was like okay that makes sense and so then I was doing like all of these like repeated extension and like lateral bending like movements and stuff and that seemed to help and you know all the it's centralized and all of that and um yeah so things were getting better but I still couldn't lift like I could every time I would try because he was telling me he was like you know you're you're okay. Like you can try to lift. But I thought that every time I was squatting and felt pain that like my disc was like 
re herniating. Like I genuinely yeah. believe that because that's how I understood my injury. Um, so I was like, okay, when I flex, it moves backward. And when I extend, it moves back in. And so like, I would literally squat and then be like, oh my God. And like, go do like 10 extensions. Cause I was like so scared. Um, and so that's, and, and you know, that's, maybe that's just me. Like maybe I just internalized that message too much and like really just believed that analogy way too much. But the thing is, you never know how your patient is going to respond to the analogy you give them. And so that's why, like when I finally, so that was back, that was a year before I found Greg Lehman's book and I stopped squatting and deadlifting for an entire seven months, I want to say. Um, and I was just doing like bodybuilding, other, other, extra, literally everything except that. Um, and it was fine. Like I convinced myself that it was okay if I never squatted again. Like I, that's how bad it was. That's how bad the pain was. I was like, it's fine. It's okay. I don't need to be like a power lifter. It's fine. Like I didn't really want to do that anyway, but I did. But like I convinced myself, I was like, it's fine. Um, so yeah. And then I, ca- I came to school, um, for PT school. And I started training at a gym that I, it's the same gym that I train at now, but like we moved locations. And I started going with one of my classmates, Charlie, and he was trying to explain to me kind of like what Greg Lehman's book said, but before, but before I had read that book, I guess I like didn't really understand that that's what he was trying to tell me. Like he was like, you should try some like box squats and like changing up the range of motion and stuff like that. And that, um, Sorry, my throat's like. <coughs> get it, get it out, get it out. <laughs> <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> I'm sorry to everyone listening. Okay, um, but anyway, <laughs> so um, I basically I was being exposed to graded movement, but I didn't know it. And then a couple months later, I saw that ebook where it was saying like it's more about being sensitized than injured. And I was like, oh, okay. Like I've learned basically in my head, I was like, I've learned pain with this movement. That's like how I kind of explained it to myself. And I was like, okay, I just need to get myself more used to doing these movements in a non-threatening way. And it was like this big eye-opening moment where I was like, I'm not reherniating my disc every time I squat. Like I'm okay. So yeah. So that was, that was huge. And that experience, that was like a whole year and a half of my life. And like some people don't have the fortune of having a friend or a book that they stumble upon that helps them get back to what they love to do. Sometimes they'll go to a clinician who just reinforces that. They're like, yeah, why would you want to go back to like squatting or powerlifting? Like that's so bad for you. Or like, yeah, you, your form sucks. Like that's why you're backwards, you know? Cause that's what was told to me. And it's like, you don't want to be that person. Like you want to be giving them permission to move and you want to have updated like literature to be able to back yourself up when you say like, it's really okay. And you're not going to do more damage. And that's why like, I think it's so important for us to have a more updated understanding because if not in our good intentioned ways of like not wanting our patients to get more hurt, because we think it's like, we rely so heavily on the biomedical that we're like, this makes sense to me. Like, I don't want you to get hurt. So I'm going to give you this advice, but it's like, you're actually just limiting them. And that's why I think it's so important to like move away from that because we're decreasing people's quality of life without even knowing it. Like, I remember as soon as I was told about that, I like posted on my Instagram, like I was like, this is super common, like about disc herniations. Like I was like, it's because we slouch so much and like, like a butt wink is really bad and like all this stuff. I'm like so embarrassed now, but (laughs) I, I just wanted to help people. I was like, oh my gosh, you guys need to know this so you don't hurt yourself, you know? Oh man, I'm having like flashbacks to myself you know like same not not that long ago <laughs> and, and it's crazy like uh but I, I think the huge thing that you had is this like personal experience you know and I think it's really important to go through that because you're actually seeing firsthand you know some of the cognitions that you have when you have that type of injury and realizing the negative consequences of what people will say you know, and, and as like healthcare professionals, we need to try to um, frame the experience in a way that's giving this person uh, 
a positive outlook on the future, you know, and, and at first when you describe uh, hearing those things, uh, you know, and not an attempt to try to put down this particular healthcare professional, you know, um, but you could tell that didn't seem to provide you any sort of future where powerlifting was going to be a healthy part of your life. Would you kind of agree with that? Yeah. And I think that was, it's also just, that's what got me into being like, we need to learn how to return people to what they were doing before, because like he wanted me to go back to lifting. Like he was definitely on board with like, you know, lifting is great for you. Um, but he definitely didn't, he didn't know how to tell me, okay, just like change range of motion, do this, do that. Like I, I didn't know how to do that because I had no background in any of that. Like I was still a psych major with no, like I had no concept of anatomy or anything. Like I hadn't taken any of that yet. So I was just like, I don't know. I didn't know how to train. Like I was just like, well, I squat this way. So I'm just going to try and go back to squatting that way. And I didn't even have the concept of like, let me decrease the load because I was like, I'm not squatting under 135 in this gym. Like that's embarrassing. So I was just like, I'm going to squat like big girl plates and like not, you know, manage loading. Like, I don't know. It was so dumb. Like, I, but it's like your ego gets in the way, you know? Yeah. It's what's well, it's, it's, it's not dumb because it happens to everyone. That's the thing, right? Like, and the majority of people that you're going to see and that I see don't, don't have that understanding at all. And that's important for us to, to educate them on things like that. You know what I mean? Like, especially with the the hopes of getting them back to what they want to do in the end. Um, I think what one thing too, like if you go by such a pure biomedical approach, like they, they were taking with you, like it kind of limits you in ways, right? Because if we're thinking like, Oh, if you're not in this neutral position, like, the, like when you squat, like, you know, don't squat. And I, they don't kind of have variations to, to, to give you this like, Oh, just do like a, a wall squat where like your back's completely fat, flat against the wall, right? Like that keeps your spine in a neutral position. That's not going to give you the jelly donut squeezing out, you know, like that, that kind of stuff limits, limits um, the people that you're working with. Whereas if you take a different approach, that's more like a movement optimist, optimist approach that like we've talked about many times on this podcast and like Greg talks about obviously in his course and all of that, all that stuff, like it allows you to, be more open to getting these people back to what they want to do and gives you more options basically to, to care for them. Absolutely. It just seemed like uh, when you were talking about too, a big thing was that the shift in the model uh, in your mind from uh, the jelly donut thing to uh, more pain is more about sensitivity because that gives you a uh, better confidence to experiment. I think mm -hmm. that's like a big thing because if you mm -hmm. know it's more about sensitivity, if you have some amount of pain during the exercise, you're probably more fine with that than if you think every time you have pain, your, your jelly donuts getting busted. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's like, so I'm training pretty consistently now and I experience pain very frequently. Um, so after that back injury, I actually had another, um, I had a knee injury, I guess you could call it cause it was an, you know, pain in the moment and then decrease in performance in the weeks following, um, that took me over a year to get over. And so that's when I started working with Jared and he kind of was guiding me through the process. Um, so that was, yeah, that was probably almost worse than my, not worse than my back, but I think it was because it was, it was the second time it happened. And again, I convinced myself, I was like, powerlifting just isn't for me. It's fine. Like I just keep getting hurt. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I'm just going to give up. But like Jared didn't let me give up. Like he, he knew that this was what I wanted to do. Even when I had convinced myself, I didn't. And, but going back to what I was saying, I think like I experience pain pretty frequently when I train, like my knee will start bugging or whatever, but I'm not scared anymore. Like I'm not, it's, it used to like terrify me. Um, and I would think that something was wrong, but now I'm kind of just like, okay, like, is it, you know, is it fatigue? Is it pain? What is it? Is, can I, is it manageable? That's usually my question is, is it manageable? And so I've been able to train through a lot of like symptoms that in the past I wouldn't have been able to. And I think shifting the paradigm to 
pain is a normal part of life and pain free is not the goal. Like I, our profession needs that. Like we need to stop saying that we're going to get people pain free because that's just not realistic. Like it's perfectly normal to go on a walk and like your knee starts hurting or your ankle starts hurting. It doesn't mean that something's wrong, you know? So it's kind of like just making that more normal is I think really important. Yeah. And I also think like, like you said, I think it's important for, healthcare professionals to be honest that are working with people like this to go through something like this to be like and it doesn't have to be powerlifting or or whatnot but like go through an experience where you have to like go through the process of like like for you like you know trying to become lift lift heavier weights you have to you have to follow a plan the plan is not always going to work out you're going to have bumps in the road you're going to have a injury and you're going to have to figure out how you deal with it and change things so that you can continue on to go towards what you want rather than you run into a bump and then you're like oh I'm done I give up I'm not I'm not moving on and I think that's that's a big problem I think in in the healthcare in in the in the world in general is like the second you get hit with something that doesn't go the way that it's you think it's supposed to go we just give up where you need to continue to pursue like through those things and that's usually where you know on the other side you get better or you reach your goals or you get to the next level and I think we don't we don't do that enough yeah and I think it's like important for us to experience injuries because it it reminds you of like the emotions that your patient goes through. Because I think especially as you get more into like, okay, pain isn't always indicative of tissue damage, it's fine. You start to, I feel like at least for me, I started to become a little like, you're fine, you know, like not get over it, but like kind of like, okay, it's fine, you know, like you're going to be okay. But experiencing it for yourself, like it doesn't matter how much you know, like it's still scary. Like th- just this week, I had an instance where I was coming out of a goblet squat of all things. Like it was like my last exercise of the session and I got this like sharp pain and I like dropped the weight and I like limped out and I couldn't even squat to parallel body weight. Um, and I got scared. I got really scared. And I like texted Jared and I was like, Oh my God, what do I do? Like, I'm like, I was terrified. I was like, I have a meet coming up in like eight weeks. Like I'm not going to like be able to compete. Like I was just, all this stuff was going through my head. And it's like, you forget that when you're so removed from it, where you haven't like gone through that experience in a while, you forget how much your patient is going through and how much they need you to like be that person for them. That's like, you're going to be okay. And like, also understand what how they're feeling and not like minimizing their experience you know Mm -hmm. especially with chronic pain that's another thing because it's like I feel like we are just like well it's not indicative of tissue damage it's more like other factors probably like you'll be fine and it kind of comes off as like I don't know a little cold I think sometimes so I think having been through it yourself you're more able to like empathize with the person I think you also start to realize the ambiguity. Yeah, can't talk right now. The uh, ambiguity of it all, right? It's like we have these models for pain and stuff like that, but they're only relevant if it helps make sense of your situation. You know, um, they're not perfect, and like that's something I've realized with my training. Is like, for example, I had this episode of back pain. I still have no idea why I had it but I had back pain for like probably two months and I literally didn't change anything in my programming and then it just went away. So it's like, try to explain that to me. (laughs) Nothing changed. I kind of just self-regulated through my uh, RPEs and it just went away, you know? So it's like recognizing that like, there's not always a perfect reason, you know, And, and starting to, experience that ambiguity for yourself, I think is important. Um, But then also realizing how important these meaningful activities are to the people you're seeing, you know, and, and to take those uh, suggestions seriously, you know, for someone like you who comes into me, it may not seem like a big deal to you uh, if you just reduce their training or something like that. But to you, that might be really, really important. And so like having that firsthand experience with what those activities give back to you can really help you empathize with like the person that's coming in that's struggling with how they continue to do that. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I think, I think I know why your back pain went away, man. 
You think you know? I do. I think it was the fact that you, your jelly donut, it adapted <laughs> and it got stronger so that the jelly would not squeeze out anymore. Yo, man, I have strong jelly donuts. I, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mel, another question I had for you is like, what, um, you know, as you finish going to your last year of school and like, as you start to look beyond that, like what, what motivates you like in the PT space right now or the, or the fitness space or like just in general, um, like with what some of the stuff that you're doing? Um, for me, it's kind of always been about giving people like their life back, I guess, or like guiding them to be empowered and kind of like help themselves. So I, I'm really passionate about working with people who believe they're a lost cause and kind of like showing them that they're not and giving them the tools to just build self-efficacy and become like these badass people. Cause I know like, you know, I, I like working with older adults who maybe think they're super fragile or have like osteoporosis or they have like 10 comorbidities and they're like, it's way too late for me to change. Like I have diabetes and diabetic neuropathy and like congestive heart failure and all this stuff. It's like, it's not too late. Like you can still get benefits from making some lifestyle modifications. Like would it have been better if you started this like 30 years ago? Probably, but it's not too late to like become a better version of yourself. And it's not like exercise is great for like all the actual like physiological effects it has, but it's also for like the locus of control and like the strength that it gives you mentally, you know? And it's like finding what that person, what's going to empower that person and then helping them like implement that into their life. Um, And so I think just, kind of slowly working with people and helping them break down like these beliefs that they have about their abilities and helping them become more like independent and stronger versions of themselves. Like that's what motivates me, especially like finishing up this rotation in inpatient rehab where we as a profession, I feel like tend to have such low expectations for the populations we're working with. I think it's time to change that. I think that just because someone does have like cardiovascular issues and um you know they are older it doesn't mean that it's too late for them and that we should start to like you know treat them differently than you would someone who's like in their 20s you know what i mean like i feel like there's definitely an attitude there that i would like to change cool that's awesome there's there's a huge attitude difference you know with people that are older and that's like uh, socially ingrained too. Uh, but it's, it's crazy when you actually start to work consistently with someone who's older and who's maybe starting from a lower spot. Uh, and you actually see they can make just as much improvements as someone who's younger. It's like mind blowing, but yeah, that's, that's super cool. Is, um, is there anything you're looking forward to going into your last year of school? Yeah, so my last clinical is going to be at Boston PT and Wellness with Mike Amato, so I'm pretty stoked for that. <laughs> that's amazing. I think yeah. he, told, he told us that when we were on the podcast with him, I think. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm super excited. That's going to be great. You're going to go ready, there. <laughs> yeah. You're going to go there and just be hype, like 24-7. <laughs> like, just every, every second, you're just going to be hyped. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, Mel, is there anything else that you want to like touch on or, or bring up before we, we wrap up here, maybe, you know, for other physio students or people considering the physio profession or any words of advice or anything? Um, I would say just don't get discouraged. Um, like, especially if, you know, you're listening to this podcast and you're trying to like be up to date in the evidence and you're learning something different in school, like, try your best. Cause like you will get angry. That's just a part of it. We want to help people. So we get protective of patients. Like it's like, how dare you tell them these things, you know? So it's perfectly normal. I think as PTs, it's in our personality to have that like protective reaction, but just be patient and like kind of just use it to grow as a person. So 
learn those narratives, learn why you don't want to preach them to your patients, and it'll help you build up your argument better. And I think like if you, you know, it's, it's frustrating to have to learn about all these like outdated beliefs, but the more you know about them, the easier it is to have a conversation about them. You know, like if you feel adamantly that like trigger points are not a thing, like you need to understand like the proposed mechanisms and have a very intelligent conversation about that for the people that you're arguing with or discussing this with to respect you. So it's important to be knowledgeable about all the perspectives and kind of like be able to have conversations with people who think differently than you. So I think all information is valuable. Um, And this is definitely something I'm still working on putting into practice. Like I definitely have days or weeks where I do get frustrated, but I think just reminding yourself that it's, it's a three, it's a three year process. That's really not that long and you'll be done before you know it. Like, I can't believe I'm almost done. Um, And then you just got to pass the boards. There's going to be a lot of, you know, studying stuff that is going to get frustrating, but at the end of the day, you're going to be working with people and you're going to get to practice how you want to practice. And you don't have to tell people that their pelvis is misaligned and that their discs are blowing out of their back. Like once you graduate, you don't have to say that. And it's like, you're the, the, you're not going to change every single person in your class's mind, all of your professor's minds. And I think um, like y'all were saying earlier, if you just, plant a seed and then someone kind of thinks about it and then eventually down the line it resonates with them it'll impact all their patients and the reality is like one person isn't going to change like everyone's minds like you're not going to change the whole world but you can still have a very significant impact so I think like we tend to get frustrated because we can't you know be in an environment at school where we can just openly talk about these things kind of like we listen, we do like on these podcasts, like I find myself going to like podcasts to hear people that think like me to like discuss stuff because I can't do it in school. But it's like, there goes my voice again. I don't know what's happening. (laughs) But it's like, um, just being, being okay with the fact that like things aren't going to change overnight. And I think things are changing. I think professors are starting to update what's being taught just a little bit at a time, but a massive change like the NPT is going to take a while. So I think just being patient and, you know, getting your work done, passing your boards and then, you know, practicing how you want to practice, you know, and you can still like, you can still learn what you want to learn outside of class on your own time. You know, like you can still feel like you're, growing as a future clinician, even if you don't agree with what you're being taught. For sure. Yeah, that's great. Um, Mel, I just want to take a second and just thank you for, you know, coming on and talking to us. And, um, you know, it makes me really happy and, and continue and motivated to continue to do what we do to hear like students coming from like your perspective and, and just some of the things that you just talked about on this podcast. Um, and, you know, um, I post on Instagram and whatnot is it's it's motivating to see younger students and people doing that and already having that understanding and I just keep I hope that you know students keep to follow follow that trend along so thank you for for uh, the awesome conversation of course thank you guys is uh do you want to leave your Instagram uh, or anywhere people can learn more about you yeah, so my Instagram's Oreos and Squats. <laughs> um, and that's pretty much the only like social media platform that I'm active on. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Will, you got anything? No, just mirroring what you're saying. Really appreciate it. I think that those are really good messages for students, uh, you know, to take forward with them. So I appreciate you sharing that. All right. Well, Everybody, I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.